Good day, grade 11 learners. Welcome to Life Science Lesson. My name is Shabnam Suknandan. This lesson is brought to you by Saibono Discovery Center in collaboration with the Kauteng Department of Education. So learners, today's lesson is going to be on the animal plants, further, actual, further uh, information on the periphera, the cynodaria, and the platyhelminthus. Right, we now look at the phylogenetic tree. Remember, you're going to do more phylogenetic trees in grade 12, and you need to know exactly what is a phylogenetic tree. Remember, it's showing you the relationships of organisms from simple to complex. And as you can see here, we, have, we start off with a unicellular protista. Unicellular, remember that term unicellular means one single cell. Example, the amoeba. And then from there, the, from the unicellular organism, we're getting more complex organisms like the periphera, which are your sponges. And then we moved on to the synodaria, which is your jellyfish. And then remember, your jellyfish has one gut opening. And then you had your platyhelminthus, which is your flatworms, basically your parasitic worms. And they become more complex as they now become triploblastic. Do you remember? Triploblastic means three layers. And then we moved on to the annelida, your earthworms. And your earthworms were actually more advanced than your platyhelminthus because now they also have a coelom and they got two guts. And then we moved to the arthropoda, which is your insects, right? Your grasshoppers, your spiders, your ants. They all belong to the insects and they become more complex. And then we're going to have your chordata, your mammals, which actually have a backbone. So now here we start off with the phylogenetic tree, giving you an overview of the progression of animals from simple to complex. This is basically showing you some of the organisms, right, in real life that we see in the oceans. Most of them are actually aquatic. In fact, the platyhelminthus, the amoeba, right, and the earthworms also, they, they live in an aquatic mode of life. So although the earthworm is terrestrial, but it also depends a lot on water for its survival. So here we have the animal kingdom in the oceans, and you can see your corals there, your sea anemones, and the fish, which actually form part of the chordata. Right, let's start off now with the phylum periphera. Remember, the phylum periphera is what? They, are, they, live, in, they live in the water, they're aquatic, right? And it's your sponges, and you can see an example of a sponge, right? It's not a real sponge, but... Remember that these sponges or these periphera, they act as filters of the sea. They actually help to cleanse the sea. But it doesn't mean that if they help to cleanse the sea, we need to pollute the sea. These are natural filters where they filter out gases such as carbon and nitrogen that are found in the sea. And by, using, by filtering it out, they actually use their own carbon and nitrogen for themselves for their survival. So here are all the sponges that you find deep, deep down into the oceans. So those sponges or those structures are forming, belonging to the phylum periphera. Aquatic means they live only in water. You will never find a periphera living on land. They asymmetrical means they don't really have a side to side definite division or a front to back. So they have no symmetry at all. They cannot be cut into equal halves in any way. So no symmetry cannot be divided into equal halves. Right. Also, what else do we need to know about the periphera? But the periphera has no sense organs in the front and there's no head region. So there's no cephalization. Most of the sense organs, feeding appendages, and the brain are near the anterior part of the body. So normally, that is what cephalization is. But in case of the periphera, there's no sense organ that's found in the anterior end. They function at a cellular level, no tissue level, just made up of simple basic cells. That is the periphera. Simple basic cells, cellular le layer level, no tissue layers, there's no cephalization. So remember, one of the most, most important characteristics of periphera or a sponge is no cephalization. That means they are unable to move forward and find a mate or find a food. They simply are sessile, means they are attached to some kind of a rock and they, can, they, are not freely, they cannot be freely moving. Right, periphera also are acelomate. They do not have a cavity 
filled with liquid. So they do not have like a hydrostatic skeleton. They just move freely in the water and sway with the currents of the water. They don't have a body cavity as in the earthworms that we learned about last week. So here's another picture again of your sponges or periphera. Right, let's look at a further closer view of the internal structure of the sponge. Remember that sponges are sessile. Another name for sessile means sedentary. Sedentary means they cannot, they are not free floating. They do not, do not float freely. They have to be attached to some form of a substratum like a rock or the seabed itself. And then they sway along with the waves, with the, with the, with the currents. So sessile organisms that feed by filtering out floating particles from the water column. So as particles float down to the sea, you'll find that the sponges will simply filter it. They'll use some of the carbon, nitrogen, and some of those organic particles for their food and for their survival. They don't have no openings to the gut. There isn't an opening. So you have what we call spicules. Spicules are a little like needle-like structures, right? So here's your sponge. And from there, you have these spicules, which are needle-like structures that project out. And in this way, you find the sponges are able to protect themselves. So sponges can protect themselves by the spicules. Remember, spicules is characteristic of our sponges. S for sponges, S for spicules. And what do they, who, which phylum do they belong to? Periphera. Spicules, sponges, and what's another name? Another sessile. So all the letters with S. The spicules are found on sponges and sponges are sessile. Means they are not free floating, okay, to obtain their food. They simply filter out the, the little particles that are flowing down with the water currents. Right, so let's look at it again. You find another si similar view of the spicules which are found on the body surface, which is just basically a cellular level, right? The body is made up of millions of spicules. So if you have to actually hold a sponge, it would poke you. That is because the spicules are a protective mechanism to the sponge. We do not want to interfere with sponges because they help in actually keeping the sea clean. But obviously, an overload of pollution is killing the sponges. And once the oceans actually get polluted, it's going to affect the water currents. And I hope you know that the ocean currents plays a very big role in the weather conditions or weather patterns of the earth. So damaging the spicules not only damages just that sponge, but it also damages all the other animals in that ecosystem that depend on the sponges to keep them to keep the ocean clean. Plus, it also affects our weather patterns, right? So what is a spicule? It's a minute, very small, sharp pointed object or structure present in large numbers. And the main function is for supporting. And also, because of the spicules, it keeps the sponges quite sturdy in the water currents. Remember, the deeper the ocean, the stronger the currents. So these sponges cannot just break off with a strong current because the spicules on their body surface actually gives them some support. Right, here's another picture now of what we have, the phylum Cynodaria. Now, Cynodaria, please don't confuse Cynodaria with periphera. Remember, periphera are sponges. They're sessile, they're attached to the bottom, they act as a filter. They're just working at a cellular level. Now, Cynodaria are your free-floating jellyfish. So you would have seen this in Finding Nemo, how these little jellyfish, right, they are like clear, trans almost transparent, mushroom-like structures floating around in the water. These jellyfish all belong to the phylum Cynodaria, and they have stinging cells, cells that can sting. And you would have came across uh, a Cynodaria as walking around the beach, along the beachfront, and suddenly you see that little blue bottle that stings your feet. Yes. That is actually a jellyfish that belongs to Cynodaria because they have the stinging cells. Here you can see now what are some of the characteristics or mode of living of the, of the jellyfish. Remember they are aquatic, means they are found 
always they are found in the oceans you'll never find for example uh, a cynodaria or a jellyfish in the river they are always found in the ocean therefore they are marine some li some live in fresh water but most of them are actually marine marine means sea water fresh water means your rivers and lakes so example your jellyfish which is your blue bottle that is actually um cynodaria right radially symmetrical means now you can actually cut them into equal halves along any plane that moves to the center so your jellyfish or your cynodaria are radially symmetrical they do not have eyes in the front right so there's no cephalization just like your periphera no cephalization now let's distinguish between the two you find that in the case of periphera it was asymmetrical in the case of cynodaria it is radially symmetrical in the case of periphera it was sessile right this is this one is free floating that means they not attach something they float freely in the water so we must know the similarities and the differences between the fi different phyla and both of them are what aquatic all right so remember now type of symmetry is radial the body plan can be cut through any plane as long as it moves to the center to obtain equal halves they usually sessile or are able to move around only a little so you find that you find that the uh, the cynodaria is free some of them are attached to the to the ground but most of them are also free floating like you see your mushroom like jellyfish and here you can see now if you cut along any plane like a pizza you can get equal halves so if it, as long as that plane moves to the center you'll be able to get your equal halves okay like that and there's a center you must move to the center to obtain equal halves so here you have your radial symmetry and example a sea anemone right let's look at the body layers of the the cynodaria remember that the cynodaria or the jellyfish or your sea anemone are diploblastic it means it has two cellular layers that's the one cellular layer here on the outside remember last week we spoke about the outside layer is called the ectoderm the inner layer is called the endoderm right and the ectoderm and the endoderm is separated by a jelly layer so your jelly layer is called a mesoglea so although it's another layer but because it's not cellular we say there's only two cellular layers ectoderm endoderm separated by a mesoderm right and then therefore they belong to what diploblastic they have two cellular layers ectoderm and endoderm they have an acellular jelly layer acellular means there's no cells in the mesoglea right and then there's no coelom present so they don't really have a body cavity filled with coelomic fluid so so cynodaria are actually acelomate just like your sponges acelomate then you have now let's look at the opening right is there a mouth a definite mouth and a definite anus no so there's only one opening to the gut that acts as both the mouth and the anus right the mouth ha often has tentacles that help to catch the prey so you find here here's an opening it's not really a mouth with lips right it's just an opening around which there are these free floating tentacles and on these tentacles there are many many stinging cells which we call nematocysts nematocytes are the actual stinging cells and from there come your nematocysts so here's many many stinging cells or your nematocysts with with nematocytes that are inside the tentacles these tentacles help to grasp and capture the prey and they all around that opening there's only one opening one opening to the gut remember and what did we say we call a uh, organism with one opening we say it was it has a blind gut so cynodaria have a blind gut only one opening around which there are these tentacles and remember you have your endoderm inside ectoderm outside and your acellular mesoglea right so here is a cross section to show you the mouth 
and all the tentacles in here and you can see there's no body cavity so therefore it is a coelomate. Here you can see now you have a sessile one so this one is a sessile synodaria right a sessile one and this one is a free floating mushroom like one and they but they move very very slowly. So synodarias occur in two different body forms two different body forms but always you can see that those little structures on the outside look very calm and very um, you know easy to touch but the minute they anything touches them they remember they are sensitive to the touch stimulus the touch stimulus will trigger them all the tentacles to come together and grasp anything that touches the tentacles in this way they are able to capture their prey because remember they, are, they have no cephalization they cannot watch or look for a prey they cannot look for a mate so the tentacles are the only ones that swing around and looking for a prey so they have they come in two body forms a sessile and this one here you can see is sessile what we said sessile it's attached to some form of a substratum and this one here is free swimming medusa this is a free swimming medusa or it's a mushroom like so here is the part that's the opening there around the inside here and all these things that you see are actually tentacles right and even the blue bottle also has one long round part like that and then it has a stinging cell which moves around your feet and stings you right let's look at another part of the stinging cells of the synodaria the synodaria has stinging organelles in their cells called nematocysts. So the cells, the stinging cells are called nematocysts that, you, that are used to catch the prey and also for their own protection. So they act as a, the, to sting the prey, to paralyze the prey so that they don't get actually captured. They don't, they are not, uh, they actually use that for protection, to protect themselves from danger. They sting the prey, okay, so that the prey won't capture them. So instead, they would sting the prey and therefore you find the cells that contain the nematocysts are called synodocytes, coming from the word synodaria, right? Nematocytes or synodocytes, those, those nematocysts, so the nematocysts, remember now, here is your nematocyst capsule, right? And you find that this that's re released now becomes your nematocyte. So the nematocysts contain the nematocytes, which are your actual stinging cells. Stinging, stinging, um, let's go look at it again. They are actually those threads that are like a barb. They have sharp ends and then they will discharge and ring themselves around the prey. So remember, let's look at it again. Synodarians have stinging organelles in their cells called nematocysts that they use to catch the prey and for protection. So they capture the prey with those barbed, white, barbed structure like things, right? And then that, what is the function of the nematocyst? They use to protect the synodaria, right? To protect them and to capture prey. We now move on to the next phylum, which is Platyhelminthus, right? So Platyhelminthus, you can see now this is a picture of the different kinds of examples of platea. Remember platea helminthus, helminthus is a is an overview, the whole phylum. And then in between under that phylum now you get different types of flatworms. But most of the worms that belong to phylum platea helminthus are actually parasitic worms. Right. You get the catenolida, and then you have use these words here stenosum, stethem, right? So if you are now going to be working in an ecological reserve and you're going to test the water all the time and when you're testing the water you see these free floating uh, platyhelminthus, right? And then you're going to analyze them and you'll say, okay, the common name is catenolida. So what is the scientific name? Stenosum, stethem, stethnum, which means that stenosum is your genus and stetnum is your species name. 
remember your genus is always in a capital and the species is always in a small letter. Then you get your polyclatida. Polyclatida is actually your common name and Thrasodmotum siphonolysis is actually your a species a genus and species and you have another worm like this so just by looking at the picture and looking at probably the cells inside you are able to detect what what worm is it actually and if it's flattened you know that that one belongs to platy element the word plat plat means flat flat worms and most of them are parasitic you can see some of them here this is an example of a tapeworm which is normally hooked into the pig's intestine, right? Or it's normally hooked into the human intestine if they eat uncooked pork uh, or pork that is infested with tapeworms, then those tapeworms get transferred into the human body. And you can see here is also an example of the tapeworm, which has a very, very flat body, flat and ribbon-like, so that they actually can stay in the human body for a long time. So let's look at some characteristics of platyhelminthus. Remember, most platyhelminthus are internal parasites. What does it mean? It means they always live within an organism and harm that organism. But some of them are aquatic and free-floating or free-living. Not every one of them is parasitic, but most of them are internal parasites. Right, so they're aquatic and free-living. They have a bilaterally symmetric, they're bilaterally symmetrical, which means they do have a definite front and back end, and they do have a definite si side to side end. So you can cut them equally into two halves from the back to the front, okay? So that means back to front, and they can be cut into equal halves. What do we call that kind of symmetry? Bilateral symmetry. So you have plateau elements is by bilateral, whereas the periphera was asymmetrical, synodaria was radial, always compare the symmetries, the body plans, right, uh, the mode of living with all these organisms. So let's see, description, bilateral symmetry, divided, body plan divided into equal halves along only one plane, that means it can be divided only into a left and right half, right. It cannot be divided into an equal front and back. Although it has a definite front and back end, you cannot say I'm going to cut it in the middle, middle across this way, then that's not going to give you an equal half. It has to be cut along the middle plane like that, from side to side, not from back to front, okay? From head to back, and not from side to side. So this, only along this one plane here, from the front to the back end, along one plane, that gives you bilateral symmetry and it cannot be cut in, in, in the middle where to give you a front half and a back half. That's not the bilateral symmetry. Okay, and then we look at cephalization. You can see here, you can actually see that this worm has eye-like structures, right? A definite head end. You can see a definite tail end over there. So here's your tail end. And you can see a definite head end, right? So here you can see, because of the definite head end, and it's very sensitive, sensitive to way, the way it moves forward. So it, cephalization means has the sense organs and nerve tissue, mainly simple nerve cells, concentrated in the anterior region of the body. What does that mean, anterior region? Anterior region means the front end, which allows them to detect what lies ahead. Right? So their simple cells allow them to know, am I approaching a rock, am I approaching a, a, some form of a prey, and it aids them in feeding and avoiding danger. So they can avoid danger like strong water currents, like a rock, because their front end has these sensitive uh, nerve cells. Here's another view right, of exactly what a flat worm would look like. This one, you can see it has a very, very small head because that head attaches itself to the human intestine. It's so small so that even food can flow over it without the head being as an obstruction. Th there's no obstruction because the head is actually hooked onto the intestine with its proboscis, right? And then the body is ribbon-like, ribbon-like so that flu food can flow over both sides, the upper part 
and the bottom part food flows over it while it's actually trapped in our intestine. And obviously, as you eat food and you digest your food, your digested food is actually getting, getting absorbed by this tapeworm, which is, which is a parasite because it's removing all your nutrition. So you will be eating food and you'll be feeling hungry all the time. But meanwhile, it's the tapeworm that's actually absorbing most of your nutrients and you're not picking up weight, obviously, because half the nutrients are getting absorbed by your tapeworms. And remember, they begin to multiply. They actually have these segments, these ripe segments at the end, which break off and there's sexual reproduction here are happening inside within them, where there, there's fertilization and new tapeworms start forming and more and more of them can form and actually travel to the brain as well. So platyhelminthus or your flatworms are very, very harmful once they enter the body. And remember, they dorsal ventrally flatten. Dorsal means they flatten from the top to the bottom, top and bottom. They flatten, which means they appear squashed from the upper, which is your dorsal part. The upper part is your dorsal. The bottom part is always called your lower or ventral side. So all platyhelminthes are flatworms. Now let's look at the body layers. The body layers compared to your uh, synodaria. Here you can see platyhelminthes has three body layers which is actually your ectoderm, your mesoderm, and the endoderm. Remember, your three body layers. But there is no coelom. There's no coelom. So here you can see, although this looks like a cavity, there's no coelom. Remember, your coelom has to be found between your endoderm and your mesoderm. But here, this cavity is here. So this is not a proper coelom. So it's acelomate. Therefore, there's no circulatory system. Remember, if there's a coelom, then it gives a chance for the body systems to grow, like your proper reproductive system, proper circulatory system, your heart, your bones, and things like that. So here there's no coelom because it's too flat. There isn't a coelom. So remember the characteristic, it's triploblastic. It has cephalization, but it's acelomate. Triploblastic means ectoderm on the outside, mesoderm in the middle, M for meso, M for middle, and endoderm on the inside, and no body cavity, and no blood circulatory system. All the organic molecules of food moves by simple diffusion. There's no blood to actually distribute all the organic food. Right. The platyhelminthes, one opening to the gut. There's only one opening. There is like a different mouth-like area, right? through which food is trapped in. So there's only one opening to the gut. The digestive cavity branches around the body to transfer nutrients around the body. So this digestive system is not, doesn't have like a stomach and an intestine or a mouth. It's just a simple cells which distribute the food throughout the body because it's very, very flat. So the transfer of nutrients occur by diffusion. Right, so only one opening, and therefore around that opening, it's very it's in the front end, right, to detect danger, to see what uh, what lies ahead, and to actually get its food. Now here are some activities. Okay, let's look at the activities here. Activity one, the diagram A below shows a complete animal, while B shows a cross section. So here's a cross section. That means if I cut it across, right, what am I going to see? How am I going to look at the body layers? So diagram A below shows a complete animal, while B shows a cross section through the main body stalk. Study the diagrams below and answer the questions that follow. Remember to always analyze your diagrams. Look at the labels, analyze it, and then look at the questions. Identify the phylum to which this organism belongs. And you can see that this is not a flat worm. So it's not platyhelminthus. You can see here that it has only two layers. One, two, ectoderm and endoderm, right? And what is that then? This one is going to be our synodaria. You see? Synodaria. Okay. Name the kind and what is this? What ex uh, your examples? Remember, it's your jellyfish, 
your sea anemones, they are cynodaria. Okay, name the kind of symmetry shown in this diagram. You can see because it's round and it can be cut into equal planes along any plane that moves to the center, then you find that that one is going to be radial symmetry. Name the type of symmetry shown in this diagram, radial symmetry. What is the phylum to which this organism belongs? It's going to be synodaria, diagram A. Diagram B is the cross section. The diagram A below shows a complete animal, the same picture again, while B shows the cross section, same stem in the question. Study the diagram below and answer the questions that follow. Question 3, explain the advantage this symmetry has for the mode of living of this organism. Right, so always look at your mark allocations as well. And learners always remember, when they use the word explain, that action verb simply means that when you say explain, you must use a cause and effect, a statement and give a reason for your statement. That is what explain means. So advantage of the symmetry, right, advantage of the symmetry in relationship with the mode of living. So what is its mode of living? It lives in the water, right? And it's, and it's not free floating. So what is the advantage? Because it has a radial symmetry, it's able to sway from side to side to catch its prey. So it's able to catch its prey easily because it's able to move around, move, move in all directions. It can catch its prey, right? sense danger from all directions because they are sedentary or sessile. So their mode of life is what? They are sedentary or sessile means they are not free floating. They cannot walk around and move on there. So because they are sedentary or sessile, they are attached to something. And because they are radially symmetrical, they can move in all directions to catch their prey and sense danger. All right. Let's look at activity two. Complete the following table showing different animal groups and their features. So you need to complete what? The animal groups and their features or characteristics. Write down only the number of the question and the answer. Please remember to answer the question. Okay? If the, look at the question and look at it that you'll always get diagrams, you can always get tables, you can always get graphs, but make sure you understand exactly what is the question asking of me. So please answer the question. Do not say if it's animal group, then you're going to say sponge. So although it may look like a sponge, but if they're asking for the group and you give the example, it's going to be wrong. So name named examples, sponges. So you, Look at what they give you first. They've given you in the table a sponge, so that must guide you. What animal group is that? It belongs to periphera, right? Type of symmetry, we know that it has a, uh, it doesn't actually have an opening, but it has a type of symmetry, it's going to be radially symmetrical. Tissue layers, there's no tissue layers. No tissue layers, it's just basic cells in the sponge. Gut opening, there's no through gut. They actually get their food from filtering through the water. So the sponge has these spicules to protect them, but also as they move around and sway in the water, their body acts like a sponge. It's like traps, traps certain particles, traps certain gases. That's why we say sponges are the filters of the sea. All right, so let's look at the numbers now that are missing. Animal group here. Phylum, how, what's going to guide you to the animal group is your example. Sponges belong to, to per, sorry, periphera, am I right? Sponges belong to periphera. Type of symmetry, we know it's radial. Tissue layers, it's no tissue layers. It's only cells. Gut, there's no through gut. How do they get their food then? By filtering to the water. They filter the water. Now let's look. Now they gave you the animal group, right? That it's synodaria. We know it's your jellyfish or your sea anemones. Example, also your blue bottles. And you know that jellyfish has one opening along around which there's tentacles. So this is going to be what symmetry? Radial symmetry. Tissue layers on the jellyfish 
remember what we had uh, what was the layers it was diploblastic remember two body layers ectoderm and uh, endoderm and then you have a blind gut remember what is the meaning of blind gut it has only one opening which acts like a mouth all right now let us we go to another to other more complex uh, organisms and that is your annelida your arthropoda and your chordata so these organisms are far more complex than your sponges and your jellyfish okay and your platyhelminthus let's see what exactly what characteristic does these animals have that make them to be more complex and differ in their body plans from the spawn your periphera and your cynodaria and your platyhelminthus you can see again from your phylogenetic tree that we had our protista which was your unicellular organism made up of one cell remember it's when it's diploblastic although it's two cellular layers it has many cells so remember your jellyfish although it's diploblastic it's multicellular your platyhelminthus is also multicellular because it had an endoderm, mesoderm, and endo ectoderm. So even your platyhelminthus, although it's flattened, it was also multicellular. So multicellular platyhelminthus, multicellular jellyfish, but acellular, oh, sorry, unicellular. Why am I, what am I saying now? You say your sponges are diploblastic so it's also multicellular so it's multicellular 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 porifera synodaria platyhelminthus are multicellular but your protista is unicellular made up of just one cell and then you remember now we've done with this and now we're going to go to annelida arthropoda and chordata and here we're going to see now there's going to be two guts Okay, and we're going to see definite cephalization because obviously they become more complex. So here, let's look at the annelida. Now, annelida is different from your platyhelminthus. Platyhelminthus, the worms were flat, flat worms. Plat means flat, flat worms. But now, annelida are all segmented worms and they are more cylindrical, like a pencil. Okay, they are more rounded. Instead of flat, they are rounded worms. And you can see here your annelida. They are actually, me annelida means segmented worms, but they're more cylindrical. Cylindrical means like a pencil, all right? Not flattened like a ruler. So your platyhelminthus is ribbon like. That's your ruler like, flat. Platy but annelida are segmented and cylindrical. And you can see here your worms. These are also parasitic, they're coming from the intestines. Of humans right it depends what we eat you can see your actual your and your earthworms here to burrow into the ground they need to be cylindrical right and they put a little openings onto the ground through which your rainwater goes through and that's very very important also it in, aids in and uh, your vegetation to become more fertile right and you find here's a whole lot of these earthworms entangled together right now let's look at line diagrams of your annelida. Remember that they are aquatic. So where do you find your, your annelida? You find most of them live in water because they don't actually have a hard area to protect them from drying out. So most of them live in fresh water, which are rivers and lakes, and they also live in the seas. They also found on land. Terrestrial means land. So aquatic and terrestrial habitats. What's the meaning of the word habitat? The place where they are found, okay? They are also bilaterally symmetrical. That means they can only be cut along one plane. That means from front to back, right? From the front end along one plane to the back end. So you get two equal left and right halves. Then they are triploblastic, which means they have three body layers. And then your annelida is the only one that has a true body cavity, a true coelom. And because of this, you'll find they are able to f have a proper digestive system as well. And they also have a proper blood system due to the body cavity. So let's look at it here, the body covering. 
we have your outside, your ectoderm, right? Then you have a middle, a mesoderm, and then you have a coelom here, and inside there is your endoderm. So your coelom is always found between your mesoderm and endoderm. So the cavity between your mesoderm, right, and your endoderm, and then that body cavity is your coelom. You can see this is the annelida. Here's your earthworm, and here's the saddle or the clitellum, which is the reproductive part of the earthworm, right? Uh, you can see now your digestive tract. You have a proper digestive tract because of the coelom. There's a space to form a digestive system, right? And you have internal organs as well. So it's an outer ectoderm, middle mesoderm, and endoderm. And in between, you have a body cavity called the coelom filled with coelomic fluid. So what are the main characteristics again? Bilaterally symmetrical. Definite head end with sense organ with sense is sensitive sense uh, nerve cells right so all the nerve cells are found in the end front end that's cephalization triploblastic and coelomate so something that has a coelom is called coelomate something that does not have a coelom is called a coelomate as in your synodaria and periphera a coelomate your annelida now this is just to show you a cross section of the muscles of the earthworm Remember, the earthworm is belonging to the phylum Annelida. It has a coelom, which is a fluid-filled cavity, and this cavity filled with fluid. The fluid is called coelomic fluid. It acts as a hydrostatic skeleton. So that you feel the earthworm, it's, you, can, you can press it. It's not soft, but it's quite firm because of the fluid and that firmness of your earthworm is due to the fluid which is acting as a hydro hydro means water static right stationary so that that water that water part inside is very making the, the the earthworm very very firm and this hydrostatic skeleton is needed for your muscles the earthworm has circular muscles and longitudinal muscles and remember learners one important thing that you need to know about muscles that you learned from grade 10 is that muscles are able to contract and relax they are antagonistic so when the one contracts the other relaxes and that's how you are able to move so even with our hands we can only move our hands because if the biceps on our upper arm contracts then the triceps must relax and that causes movement. But we have a bony skeleton. Our skeleton is bone, right? So those muscles need to contract against something firm. So in the case of the earthworm, the circular muscles and the, and the longitudinal muscles, so you have your circular muscles, right? And your longitudinal muscles, they will contract and relax against your coelomic fluid which acts as a skeleton, and that's how the earthworm moves from front to back, front to back. Okay. Here is your earthworm, and here you have a definite mouth end and a definite anus, anal end. So it has two openings, two proper openings. One to take in food, to take in food that is called ingestion. Remember, ingestion means the taking in of food. Then once food is taken in and digested and absorbed, all the food that is not absorbed needs to be removed. And it must be removed through the anus. And the removal of undigested food is called egestion. So the mouth is for ingestion and the anus is for egestion, getting rid of unwanted food. And because there's two definite openings, mouth to anus, we say that annelida is characteristic of having a through gut, not a blind gut. Okay, not a blind gut like the flatworm. This has a through gut. Right. Segmented, segmented means their body consists of repeating segments called metamers. So all these. So if I must draw the earthworm like this now, right? 
I have a very, uh, you find that the front end and the back end look almost the same, right? But if I divide the body into segments like this, then I'm making metamias, a whole lot of metamias. So these segmented bodies, so it's cylindrical cemented bodies, ne? and then you're going to have one part here, or which is just one little part, okay. Let's move that. Okay, let's just erase this whole thing here. You're going to say your whole segmented body part here, and somewhere in the middle, you have an area called the clitellum, right, and that's where your reproductive part is, but the rest of the body is segmented, right, and in this area here also, between segments 32 to 37, that is the reproductive parts or segments of the, of the earthworm. That is the reproductive area where the gametes actually are going to be fertilizing. Uh, be, uh, fertilization is going to occur here and diploid zygotes are going to form here. So this is a reproductive system found in the clitellum. So remember clitellum is a reproductive area. There's a mouth end and there's a tail end and the body is divided into segments. And what do we call the segments? Each segment is called a metamere or metamere's segments. Right. Now, what are some of the things now? We, now we're going to look at the arthropoda. So your beetles, your locusts, right, your termites, your ants, your scorpions, uh, your bees, your butterflies. Then you have what? You have, this is a bed bug that lives in the mattress, your cockroaches, even your mosquitoes, everything that has segmented legs, right, and a hard exoskeleton to protect itself. Your spiders, your crabs, they all belong, here's your spider, right, that they all belong to what? And here's your prawns and your crayfish, even a fly. Okay, we categorize them, they, although they may, some of them may be insects and some of them may look like, this looks like a fish, but how can it be? They remember, if it has an exoskeleton, right, and segmented legs, certain, certain kind of characteristics fall under a certain phyla. So all these belong to arthropoda. The very common one that we know of is the locust, right? The locust has a very hard exoskeleton. So with arthropods, you find that they can be aquatic and they can be terrestrial. So remember, your prawns and your crabs, they are found where? In fresh water and in the sea, okay? So you have your aquatic freshwater arthropoda, and you also have your terrestrial ones, like your flies and your locusts and your butterflies. They are all terrestrial. They live on land. Then bilateral symmetry, they can be cut into two equal halves, okay? So you can see here's my butterfly, and then here's my the wings. And obviously, if I cut it along this one plane, I can get a definite left and right half. Okay? Left and right half means I can, that's bilateral symmetry. Cephalization, you can see that in a butterfly, it has a proper head, it has eyes, even the locust has the antenna, it has a head, it has eyes, it has a mouth. So it has a definite end, head end to look for prey and to detect danger and to move forward. All right? And they have three body layers, which is triploblastic. Arthropods, just like your annelida, they have a through gut, two openings to the gut, a definite mouth to take in food, a definite anus to get rid of undigested food, right? And that is ejection. Under, getting rid of undigested food to the anus is ejection. Taking in of food is called ingestion. So there's two openings, right? So animals with two openings to the gut consume food through the mouth and excrete waste through an opening called the anus. This is called what? A through gut. And you can see food is moving right through it, obviously through a digestive tract. Sections of the digestive system is specialized. So just like humans have a specialized digestive system which begins in the mouth where we take in food, then our teeth and tongue move the food around, and then we swallow with the tongue, then it goes to the esophagus. Even the earthworm has a mouth and an esophagus and a crop and a gizzard, right? A digestive system where food is crushed and then absorbed and, and then ingested through the anus. So here you can see that the earthworm 
as much as it's so small, it has a very, very well-developed digestive system. And that is because of the presence of the coelom. So remember, learners, learn the most important words here through gut, mouth, anus, cephalization, triploblastic, coelomate, hydrostatic skeleton. These are the characteristics. So you make a mind map. When you're doing, when you're doing, for example, earthworm, make a mind map, right? When you're doing arthropoda, make a mind map as well. So here, arthropoda, we know it has two openings. Now you're going to look at um, another part of the arthropoda, and we're coming across another word now, a hemoseal. Seal, also like a cavity. But now, coelomate animals... It means there is a cavity. In the case of the earthworm, always compare your animals, your body plans, your characteristics of all the different animal biodiversity, of animal diversity, right? Animal diversity means different kinds of animals. Look at the characteristics. Compare the symmetry, the coelom. Here you have, for example, in a locust, you have what we call a hemoseal, a cavity that's filled with fluid, it may not be blood, but it acts like blood. And that helps as in, a, as in the form of circulating all your nutrients. So in the case of a locust or a spider, there is a coelom or cavity which is filled with a transparent-like fluid acting as blood. It even has a small little heart. You can see a water with a blood vessel. Here's your heart. It has an a water here. And because the fluid that's coming from the heart is found in a space. We say it has an open blood circulatory system. Means that the blood or liquid is not confined to blood vessel. So open blood system means not confined to blood vessels. Instead, the fluid is formed in a cavity and the fluid helps to transport nutrients throughout the body, the fluid in that cavity, like currents. There's currents that move in there and actually assist in circulating all the nutrients throughout the body. Although it has a heart-like structure, but the blood is not confined to blood vessels. Therefore, all your arthropods have an open blood system, whereas annelidas have a closed blood system. Right. Arthropoda are far more advanced in terms of their segmentation. You, your earthworm had all the, the segments looked the same. But now with arthropoda, the segments look different. You have a, three segmented parts. The first segment here is your head. Then you have your thorax. And then you have your abdomen. So you have a head, thorax, and abdomen. So you see... These are not metamias, you know, segments that look the same as in an earthworm. These are definite, you can see, that's a head region with the antenna and eyes. That's a thorax where you have the digestive system. And that's your abdomen where there is an, a, the, there is an anus and probably even your reproductive system. Né? And all the appendages, the, the, the parts that help it to move, they are jointed, jointed legs. They can actually move with, so that... They're, not, they're just not moving by means of a hydrostatic skeleton and circular and longitudinal muscles as in the earthworm. But these actually have proper appendages or tentacle or kind of like structures that enable it to move. As you've seen your ants and your mosquitoes and things like that. And your flies, they have legs. Now you can see you have your, your different kinds of bugs and you can see the body is segmented plus. You can see with arthropods that there's always a very hard covering, as in a cockroach as well. You see in a crab, you see in a prawn, that shell-like structure, which is quite hard. It is called an exoskeleton. Exo. Exo means outside. This is a hard part outside the body of the arthropod. So it's waterproof. Ne? And it's made up of chitin. The kind of a carbohydrate is called chitin. So all the shells of a crab, the shell of a prawn, 
the shell, the, the hard part of a cockroach. So if a cockroach dies and you see that the ants have eaten it and the parts that left behind, that is your exoskeleton and it's made up of chitin. What does it do? It protects the body from drying out. Okay? So the soft inner parts, the, the, the inner parts of the body are protected by an exoskeleton. It prevents, the, so that, that means now, earthworms are able to get the oxygen from the air through their thin epidermal layer on the outside. Oxygen diffuses into their body. That's why earthworms must always be moist. But unlike earthworms, arthropods have a very hard, dry exoskeleton. So gases from the outside cannot diffuse into the body of the ant or the insect. They need to have a proper kind of a respiratory system to take in gas, right? So you find exoskeleton prevents the diffusion of gases because it's waterproof. Arthropods have a developed gases exchange organs like gills and lungs. So they have to take in oxygen like humans. We cannot block our nose and get a say that oxygen must diffuse through my skin to get into my lungs. No, we need to have proper nostrils leading to the outside to inhale air. Same thing with arthropods. They need to have little nostril-like structures to actually take in air, which gets into the lungs, right? And then all the gases are transported via the hemocele throughout the body. So the exoskeleton does not grow. So although the inside of the body grows, arthropods have to shed. They have to get rid of the outer skeleton as they grow. So the exoskeleton does not grow. It does not grow. Our bone, as we, gr as we were a baby, and then we gr grow into a toddler, and then into a, into a teen, and then into an adult, our bony skeleton grew with us. But now not with cockroaches and not with ants and, and crabs and prawns. As they grow, they have to constantly shed that exoskeleton, right? And that's called like molting. So it does not grow and it must be shed regularly and regrown. Arthropods are vulnerable during the regrowth because it's weaker and requires a lot of energy. So now these arthropods can be easily trapped when they are in the molting stage. What's the molting stage? The stage whereby the exoskeleton is shed and the organism is now growing. Vulnerable means now it can be easily attacked, attacked by predators because there's no exoskeleton to actually protect it. So let's look at the slide. What does it tell us? What's the main parts of the slide? That all arthropods have a waterproof exoskeleton. Right. It protects the arthropods from drying out. It prevents the diffusion of gases, okay? They, they have a definite, well-developed gases exchange system. They have an open blood system. The exoskeleton does not grow, and it undergoes, it has to be shed regularly. So here are some, now we go to chordata. So chordata, chordata comes from the word notochord. Notochord means the development of a spine. Development of a spine means that there must be a vertebral column, the bones around your spine. So these are our more advanced animals, like your tigers and your, your, your shark and your whales and the humans and the snakes and elephants, right? You find these have a proper backbone. They have a proper head end with sense organs. They can sense danger. They can see danger. They can look for their own prey. They can look for their own mate. So these are far more advanced. And also, they are, we are all bilaterally symmetrical, meaning we display civilization, but we can be cut into equal halves from the back to the front along one plane only. So here's your chordata, means all of them have a backbone. Your backbone is what? Your bony skeleton. So we have a backbone, means our bones are inside and not a hard covering on the outside like your arthropods. So now remember, Annelida had what kind of a skeleton? Hydrostatic skeleton. Annelida, hydrostatic skeleton. And then your arthropoda, exoskeleton. And your chordata, endoskeleton. So what kind of a skeleton do we have? Endo inside the body, made up of bones. So vertebrates have backbones, right? To keep them 
supported, to keep them upright so that they can move easily. Aquatic means as much as we are terrestrial, we live in la on land. You have other kinds of chordata, like your, uh, we also the elephants live on land, your snakes live on land, some live in water, your tigers live on land, and humans live on land. But what about the whales and the fish? They are also chordata, they have a backbone, right? But they are marine, they live in the water. But we all chordata are bilaterally symmetrical, all are more complex, so they have an ectoderm, which is our skin, endoderm, or your muscle layer, and, and obviously we have a mesoderm and, the, and a cavity where all our the systems have formed, our bones have formed. So we, have, we are multicellular and we have three definite layers from which the body has formed, your ectoderm, endoderm, and your mesoderm. A coelomate means we do have a cavity in which... So all your digestive system, your intestines, your reproductive organs, they found inside your abdominal cavity. That cavity was a coelom when we were, when we were developing as a fetus, right? Our body is segmented, yes. We do have a definite head end. So we do have a he head end. We have what? A thorax end. And then we also have an abdominal end. So our bodies are actually divided into three parts. Head, body, head, thorax, and abdomen. The middle part, our thoracic vertebra, where is our ribs and our lungs. And then we have our abdomen, where you have your reproductive organs, right? And your intestine as well. So even our body is segmented into a head, thorax, and abdomen. Remember, that's characteristic of chordata. But metamias, characteristic of your annelida. We also have two body openings. That means we have a mouth to take in food and we also have an anus as the end part of the, of the digestive system to get rid of your undigested food. So now you have here, right, you have a through gut there. We went to that slide. Chordata, we, all vertebrates have a rod-like structure named a notochord. That means your spine moves, right, when you're standing upright, vertical position, you have an upright spinal cord to keep you supported. If you are moving around like a whale or like a shark and you are dorsiventral or horizontal, here's your notochord or your spinal cord here that supports the body against which muscles can contract for it to move. So remember when you're first forming, your body cannot be bone-like because the fetus must be flexible enough to move. So at the beginning of the fetal stages, when you're just growing in the womb of the mother, all chordata data animals, when they are just forming, their spinal cord is not bone, it is cartilaginous. When it's in that stage, we say it's in the form of a notochord. But when it's fully developed with bones around it, we said now you developed a spinal cord with a vertebral column. Here you're now having your, um, ha you find your chordata, right? You have a nerve cord. Nerve cord, spinal column, or spinal column there, that's your spinal cord. Remember, you have your spinal cord there, and around your spinal cord, you have all your vertebral bones, right? Forming your vertebral column, all right? You also have a definite head end and a definite tail end, head end and tail end. You can see here the developing fetus, right? You can see the head end here, that cephalization with your eyes and your brain, and then from your brain comes your cartilages notochord here, and that is your tail end, which is going to form your digestive system here, and your anus as well. Phylum chordata initially developed pharyngeal gill slits that, appear, that disappear in terrestrial chordates at adulthood. So you find now in a whale, right, these are pharyngeal slits. These are the formation whereby now is the formation of your respiratory system. Okay, so water filters through the gill slits of the whale and the shark. So marine chordates have pharyngeal gill slits, which is the formation of your respiratory system. But we do not have pharyngeal slits because we have a definite nostril. All right. Then your you're looking at your different body layers. Chordatas can be ectothermic and endothermic. 
So now you have body, different body layers, but also now, do not get confused between the words ectoderm, endoderm, and then you're going to get the word ectothermic and endothermic. Remember, these are different words. So, now you're going to have your ectothermic, ectotherm. The word thermic or therm means body temperature. So, ectothermic or thermic means body temperature. What about the body temperature? What kind of a condition or temperature conditions or environment do these chordata live in? Chordata can be ectothermic means that um, they, they can only, they have, they, they can, their body temperature fluctuates, okay? They are cold-blooded, like for example, your snakes, all right? Their body, their body temperature is controlled by the temperature on the outside. Endothermic animals means the body temperature is regulated at all times. So whether it's cold outside or hot outside, our body temperature remains the same. Our skin is able to control that temperature. Therefore, we are called endothermic. We will behave and do the same things throughout the year, irrespective of whether it's a heat wave or we have a cold front. Our temperature remains at 37.5 degrees Celsius. Now, if you look at ectothermic animals, such as your reptiles or your snakes, you'll find that when the temperature change, when it's winter, snakes go into hibernation okay they hibernate because they cannot be active the temperature will also start dropping so therefore they go into hibernation so the body temperature of exothermic animals the body temperature of exothermic animal is regulated by the external environment so when it's cold outside the snake's temperature also drops and if the temperature drops remember they can be inactive so during winter you cannot find snakes because they're hibernating, all right? The body temperature of endothermic animals is regulated by internal metabolic reactions. Now, as our cells respire and release energy in the form of ATP and heat, our heat that is produced by respiration, that heat is, must be 37,5 37 degrees. So we generate heat from the inside of our body. That's why it's called endothermic, whereas ectothermic, they depend on the temperature from the outside. Therefore, you find lizards, right? Lizards actually go and sit against the wall or a rock in winter because they depend on the sun's temperature to control their body temperature. So they are exothermic, exo, exothermic, or you can even say ectothermic. It means from the outside. Here you have now some activities that consolidate all the phyla that we've discussed. Study the diagram below and answer the questions that follow. Identify in which each, the phyla to which each organism belongs. Identify in which phyla each organism belongs. Now you can see here you have your sponge, which is your filter, so that's periphera A. B, you can see it's a dolphin, it has a definite spinal cord, and therefore you can see proper civilization, but, but it has a spinal cord, so that's chordata. You can see here your jellyfish or your sea anemones, and that jellyfish, so that is your cynodaria. You can see our segmented earthworm, which is cylindrical, and that's annelida, and that's D. And then your E, this is the end, it has a definite head, thorax, and abdomen, segmented body, so that's arthropoda. F, you can see that's a flatworm or planaria, and that is your platyhelminthus. Same pictures again, but different questions. Which organism is considered the most, not just advanced, but most advanced? And that is going to be obviously your chordata, because they have all the characteristics. Right, chordata, because they have most of the advanced characteristics, that is through gut, it has coelom, it has cephalization, a proper spinal cord, okay, and they actually can look for their prey on their own by looking, by having eyes and moving forward. Next one, which phyla do not have tissues or organs? It's your periphera, remember, they are you, your, your periphera, right, 
it, it has just basically one cellular, two cellular layers. So the one that do not have tissues or organs is your periphera. Describe what a notochord is. It's a cartilaginous rod-like structure which supports the body in all chordata. Remember, a notochord is a developing spinal cord, but at that stage, it's cartilaginous. Same pictures again, another question. Name the phyla that has nematocysts, remember stinging cells, and describe the purpose of those nematocysts. So which one had your nematocysts? Remember, it was your jellyfish with the tentacles, and on their tentacles, they were the nematocysts. So it's your jellyfish, which belongs to Cynodaria. The phylum, do not say jellyfish, that's an example. Phylum is Cynodaria. They have nematocysts on the tentacles. For what reason? To capture prey and also for their own defense. So remember, it's for protection, defense, and to capture prey. What function... What is the function of the hemocele in arthropoda? Remember, hemocele is a cavity filled with a fluid which acts like blood. And what does blood do? Our blood transports nutrients throughout our body. So the hemocele is a cavity that is filled with fluid, right? That acts like blood to transport nutrients and gases throughout the body. So it has an open blood circulatory system. So the hemocele is an open blood circulatory system. And what did we say is the open blood circulatory system? A system which where the fluid is not confined into blood vessel, but it transports your nutrients like your amino acids, your glucose, your vitamins, and water and oxygen throughout the body. And then you have your columns here to match. Remember, you must say A, B, A only, B only, or none. So 1.2.1 .1 is characteristic to chordata. Remember, chordata have an inner skeleton, endoskeleton, and closed blood system. So that's going to be what? Both A and B. Phyla that are triploblastic. Remember, it was your platyhelminthus and your annelida. There's no chordata there, but even if chordata was there, then that would also be right, okay? But here it's platyhelminthus and annelida, three body layers. Animals that have a complete tube-like gut with two openings, tube-like gut with two openings is going to be arthropoda. Remember, synodaria only had one opening. So the best answer would be arthropoda. Right. 1.2.4, segmented bodies. You can say annelida, but jointed legs. That will tell you that it's arthropoda and not annelida. What makes it confine it to arthropoda is because of this, jointed legs. That's why we say arthropoda. Thank you, learners. Please remember that this is your animal biodiversity. We've also done the plant biodiversity. And the best way to learn this section is by putting all your criteria on one side, like symmetry, your, your symmetry, your trip, your, your, your through guard, your coelom. And then you actually spot, see what are the similarities and what are the differences and which one is more advanced and what are the body layers and what is each part actually responsible for. Have do mind maps. You, and once you have mind maps, you are able to actually master the vocabulary relating to your animal biodiversity. Thank you.